So is anyone else wanting, I mean, not that you have to apply, but I can just pass it out to you if you want it. Um, but I do have a scholarship it's a thousand dollars per semester if you have 12 hours or more that you're enrolled in but if you're enrolled in one to 11 hours it's 500 dollars per semester um there are things that you have to do like to get the money i'll put them up here real quick like you have to write a thank you letter because the money comes from the people who donated the golf tournament so we like to give them letters but just from the students that say thank you for their their contributions um the main idea of my grant was to create an actual math club because we have a math interest group, but it's not actually a full-blown club recognized by the institution, okay? Um, yeah, we go and we play games and I give you scholarship information, but it's not like an actual club, okay? Um, so that's the whole goal is to try to turn it into a club. Um, and then of course, in order for us to do that, we'll have meetings and You'll also help with an event, but not till the spring, just for the spring people. Um, but I do have another event that you would need to attend to. You guys are probably gonna wanna attend to it anyway, if you can, just because I usually give bonus points in all my math classes if people attend that STEM lecture series. Um, who do we have? We have an engineer this time. He's actually one of the engineer faculty, his name is Terrence Jackson. And so he's gonna talk to us about, not just only what he does here, but like what he does outside of St. Louis, okay? which is the more important stuff, <laughs> but he does really cool stuff. Um, and then the last thing is, is you do have to maintain the GPA of 2.5 or higher. That's not my standard, that's the people's standard who gave you that. Okay. Um, but is anybody wanting to look at it, see what it's about? Okay, I'll go past that now. Okay. Is this an SED or is this a 
You think the reason why I'm asking is because you might want to find out if it's actually the same reason and not some other reason. If you do become interested in it later, you can just let me know. Okay. Um, so I saw in the comments most of you like the shortcut idea rather than doing the limit. Um, where it's going to be an issue is basically just the manipulation, right? So that we can make it look like x to the power something. Um, because we have two basic rules in this particular section. We have some other ones for like the trig functions and all of that good stuff. But we have two basic ones that we're using a lot in this section. I'm gonna pull up my little sheet. So the first one that we're using is um, this one here. And it's basically the constant multiplier rule. So it basically just tells me that if I do have a constant times some function, it's just gonna be that constant times the derivative of that function. Okay, see so the constant just kind of carry along as a multiplier throughout the whole thing, okay? Nothing really happens to them unless they get multiplied by something. Um, then the other major rule was, is this one here, well, these two actually, that the derivative of a constant is what? Zero. And then a derivative of any expression to a power you followed this process. Now we haven't learned about this guy yet because that's chain rule and chain rules are 3.4, okay? But we have learned about this rule where if you have something with an exponent, you bring down the exponent, then you decrease the exponent by one, right? That part we know about, okay? Later on your base, right? This, you have a base and you have an exponent that makes up this little expression u to the n, right? Your base is the u, and then the exponent is the n. When the base is just x, you don't have to worry about this little thing over here. You just bring the power down, decrease the power, and the x stays an x, right? Later, when we get to 3.4, your base will not just be x, okay? And so you will have a way to do it. Right now, the only rules that we know, we're not able to do it. So we'll kind of do other things to go around about it. For instance, I think I saw a problem in there that had something like this, okay? It says, you know, to do the derivative of this. Now, here, I could have just foiled this all out and done the rules that I learned from 3.2, and you would have been perfectly fine. You're going to learn another way to do this called the product rule later, okay? There's also another problem I think that I saw. It was something like this like x squared plus one squared. And so right now you have to actually foil this out and then take the derivative of each term individually. Whereas later when we get to 3.4, we'll figure out how to do the derivative of that without having to multiply it all out. And especially if this was a seven exponent, you're not gonna sit there and multiply it out seven times, right? But once you learn 3.4, you'll learn a way to do it, even if it has a seven or 100 or whatever it is. Okay, so what 3.4 is interesting, and unfortunately, this sheet of paper has 3.4 already incorporated into it. Okay, so if some of the rules might look a tiny bit different than they do when I was giving the lecture in the video, but they're just modified. These are basically all encompassing. So once you learn all of the derivatives, then all of this will make sense. Okay, um, but for right now, we're just going to use some of the basic ones. The first one, I'm really glad this stuff represented. Um, the first one is that the derivative of a constant is what? I'll just write it down. The derivative of a constant is zero. The derivative of um, x to any power is what? 
the power times x, then minus one. Yep, that's it, you got it. And then what about, I think they did something like this, right? Where you have c and then a function, regardless of what that function is, you can just take the function out and just multiply by the derivative of that function, right? What's a way that we write that? F prime, exactly, okay? So they don't use F in this sheet of paper, they use U, okay? So instead of saying F like a whole function, they just put U. That's the only difference between the sheet of paper and this. You shouldn't have, if you find it, let, we'll talk about it, okay? Um, dun, dun, dun. Okay, and then some of the other basic ones were like these, right? The derivative of sine is what? Let me erase that. What is the derivative of sine? Cosine. What is the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. What is the derivative of tangent? That's tiny. Did you have these teeth, right? What does that say? Secant squared. Yes, yes. Okay. And the only reason this little u prime is there is because if that's not just an x or a t or a theta or whatever the variable is, then you do have to apply chain rule. But we haven't learned that yet. We won't have that situation. Okay. But those are the basic ones. I think we also had the derivative of an exponential. It just happens to be the exact same exponential, right? As long as it's just e to the x. If it's e to anything else besides just x, it will require change rule, okay? So with all of that, we're going to start some of them. And then maybe um, Ozzy can find that one problem. So for this problem here, we have 3.2 number two, and I chose to do part A only because part B was already in one of the videos, okay? So for part A, it says, find the slope of the tangent line to this graph at this point. So when they're asking me for the slope of the tangent line, what do I need to do? How do you find the slope of a tangent line? Yes, we need to find M10. And specifically, we need to find M10 evaluated at that specific number, right? So M10 is going to equal F prime of what number? Right, so is the x value in this parentheses, right? So I definitely need to figure out what f prime is. Now, this happened on the test a lot. Am I even allowed to use the letter f? Nowhere in there does it even say anything about f, does it? And a lot of you are doing that. If you're gonna use some letter, you need to tell me what that letter is. Like we know m tan means slope of a tangent line, right? That's okay, but f, what the heck is f, right? So I have to say over here that f of x is going to be this guy. And then I could figure out what f prime of x is. What is going to be f prime? This one's a little tricky because of that exponent. Tell me what you like. It's okay if you're wrong. Now's the time to be wrong, right? <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, negative one over five X. Yeah, you got it, six over five. Why is it negative six over five? Right, we are minusing, right? So it's negative one over five and then take away one. Right? And so when you do that, you do get that exponent negative six over five. Okay. But now what do I need to do to finish giving them what they want? Mm -hmm. Let me just um, fix my focus here so it can stop toggling because it does this <laughs> going in and out thing. So then, yes, we're going to do f prime of 32 and plug in that 32. Now, luckily we do have our scientific calculators so we can figure out what this is without having to use our minds too, too much at this point. The raise to the negative six fifths. 
Does this expression in my calculator look like what I have on my paper? So I'm going to hit enter, and it's negative 1 over 320. And so this is the slope of the tangent line. I have found exactly what I needed to find, right? I always like just to warm us up with that little power rule. But we have another rule too on this sheet of paper. On this sheet of paper, it says, if I am adding or subtracting two different terms, I can just take the derivative of one term and then the other term separately. And if there's a plus here in the middle, then there will be a plus there in the middle of those two, right? If there's a minus there in the middle, there will be a minus in the middle of those two. So essentially that rule that gives me the ability to differentiate term by term by term, okay? So I never have to look at the whole expression and try to figure out what it is. I could just look at each individual term, okay? So for instance, on 33.2, this is like number seven in the number five, okay? Yours might have different trig functions because I noticed that the trig functions were in red. And I also noticed that the denominator was in red. So you might have different a different number in the front and you might have different um, trig functions. But it should either be sine, cosine, or tangent because those are the three we learned about, right? So if I'm gonna do the derivative of this one, what am I gonna write to tell the reader, whoever's reading this, whether it be your classmate or me on the test, right? What am I gonna do to tell the reader that I am actually taking the derivative? Say it again. D over dx is a great idea. What is the other one that I heard? Yes, one goes before the other. So you could write this. I never do, but you could write this. You could say, I'm going to take the derivative of this, and I'm going to take the derivative of all of this side. Okay. That is perfectly okay. You're telling the reader what you're going to do. Okay. That's all that that line is doing. It's telling you what you're going to do. But then when you actually do it, what is the derivative of y? y prime. And then we'll talk about the derivative of that. Okay. I normally don't write this unless I get into the crazier stuff later in 3.3. Because in 3.3, you have to like, at the beginning, I'll write it and then I won't. Um, because you have like one guy that stays the original and then another guy that's supposed to be the derivative. And then another guy that stays with the original, and then another guy that does the derivative. And so I don't like to do the derivatives. I always like to write the game plan first. And this is how you write the game plan. So this is my game plan for finding the derivative, right? I'm taking, I'm telling you I'm going to take the derivative of both sides of this equation. Okay. Now we have done the left. That one's not so bad. How would you take the derivative of this first term? We don't even have to, well, we could, you just, you could, and I do in the video, but <laughs> you want to eventually just look at that and then just write the answer, okay? So I'm going to try to start weaning you off all of the DDX stuff as much as I can, okay? <laughs> but yes, so we do know that pi over seven is a constant, right? It's not a variable, okay? There's, it's not a letter. I know it looks like pi, so you're like, yes, it's a Greek letter, but it's not considered a letter, it's considered a number, right? Um, so that is just our constant multiplier. Our function there, though, is the guy next to him, right? The sine. And so what is the actual derivative of sine? Cosine. Then I would have to write my minus symbol in the middle, but then I could go look and see what is the derivative of cosine negative sign. And then all I would need to do is just clean this up a tiny, tiny bit, right? And just combine those double negatives. So what should go in the middle then? Plus. So not too, too bad, right? Again, I don't normally write this step, but it's not wrong if you do, okay? You're just telling me what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. 
if you were to write this equals all of this, that would be the exact same thing as y prime. Yes, these two, these two things are the exact same thing. The, yeah, eventually. Mm -hmm. It will come back though, into chapter three. <laughs> it's like it goes away and then it comes back. It's kind of always there, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it should have accepted it. It might have been the way you typed it in, but it should accept both. It should accept this or I cosine theta plus seven sine theta over seven. It's just like getting a common denominator, right? If I want this one to have a common denominator, don't I have to multiply by seven over seven? That's like multiplying by one, so it doesn't change anything, right? So then you end up with this term plus this term on the top, and then they'll both be over seven, so you could just write it over. But you either have to type it like that without the seven over seven or in one big fraction. It shouldn't force you to type it in this way. Said this was the final answer. Is this the same thing? Is that the same thing? Right? It's like if there's a over and over imaginary one, right? And you did top times top and then bottom times bottom. Right? They're all equivalent. I'm glad you brought that up because I don't know how many of you are actually going into the book and doing all the extra problems. Um, like, <laughs> every now and then I get someone that's like, give me more problems. I'm like, they're in the book. Oh, but that's a fun thing because that's how I learned calculus is we just had that big giant textbook and you did the problems in the book and you checked them back in the book to see whether the answer was right. And what was so interesting is sometimes my answer looked nothing like the answer that they had, but I had to go and manipulate mine just to see if it was equivalent to what they had in the back of the book. And so honestly, that really helps me like practice that manipulation part. Um, but now you have the computer and the computer like accepts all different variations of the correct answer. It's a little bit different. I don't think it makes you work as hard. <laughs> um, okay, good. That one was not too, too bad, right? Two, two curls, not too bad. Number nine is very similar. I think I skipped over number eight because there was one in the video like number eight. But this one also has how many terms? Two terms. Are there constant multipliers on this one? Mm -hmm. Any other constant multipliers? And the seven. So really we're only taking the derivative of what and what. Exactly, you the x and cosine. Now I'm not gonna do the d, d, x thing. I'm just gonna go for it. And they told me to find the derivative, here's my derivative, okay? So there's my constant multiplier to third. And what is the derivative of e to the x? It's the same exact thing, e to the x. I'm gonna put my plus sign in the middle and my constant multiplier. And then what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sign. And so then all you can do is really just clean that up by combining the positive seven times the negative sign, making it right. So here I'm just going to box this bottom one just because it's at the bottom. And then here I'm going to box. So it's not too, too bad, but they are going to get weirder, right? <laughs> we have some that we really have to manipulate. Okay. 
So the next one I have is this one here. So we don't know how to take the derivative of fractions just yet. Right, we're gonna we're gonna do some. We have to basically make it not a fraction, right? And how do you make it so that it's not a fraction? Exactly, you use that negative exponent idea, right? So I'm not writing g prime. Why am I not writing g prime? Right, I have not done any differentiation rules yet, right? All I'm doing is just rewriting what was there in a different way. So that I could take the derivative. And that's where a lot of people will just start writing g prime. And I'm like, well, no, that's not the derivative. We just rewrote the original. It's still the original. But then now you can do your derivatives, right? So I'm going to write g prime. And what's the derivative of t squared? Yes, because if you minus one, it's just a one exponent, right? We don't ever write the one exponent. What about the second term? That one's a little bit more complicated. This is a constant multiplier, right? And then what's the derivative of t to the negative three? So what is this guy's derivative? Negative three T, and if I minus one, yes, you get negative four. So it becomes two T, and then what does this become? Plus six T to the negative four. Could I have gone from here to here? Mm -hmm. And you're gonna want to, because I promise the problems are gonna get crazier. You don't wanna write, the whole thing all over each little tiny step, right? Okay. You cannot, they're not like terms. If they are like terms, you can add them together. Okay, now I could type this in, but if they gave you the problem with a fraction, chances are they want the answer with a fraction, okay? So we know that negative exponents cause fractions. So this guy's okay, but how would I write this one as a fraction? And to the fourth power. Good, good, good. So remember that six does not have an exponent on it, right? So it does not go to the bottom. Only the t has a negative exponent. So only the t goes. The exponent, yes. Once it moves. No, for me, I don't care. As long as you've done the derivative, I'm good. <laughs> Oh, good. It doesn't care. Okay, yay. Then it takes this one or this one. I'm just going to box the bottom one because at the bottom, but it takes with either one, this one or this one. Haven't I officially taken the derivative for both, right? And I simplified it with that six thing. But yes, shortcut here for now. Is that if you already have a coefficient and you got to bring this thing down, you just multiply them together. Okay. So negative two times the negative three would have made a positive six. And then when I took away one, I would have gotten it. These little shortcuts might sound silly and be silly, but when the problems get more elaborate, which they will, it's going to be helpful to have all those little shortcuts. Okay. So the next one I have is like number 15. And so for this one, what would be the strategy? Because we can't do it when it has fractions yet. We don't know that rule. 
Mm -hmm. Split it up individual. So I have not taken the derivative yet, so I'm keeping the same label. But you're right, we'll split this up. But the problem is, is it's still a fraction, isn't it? Yeah, you can simplify it and then there won't be, right? So what will we get for the first term? 9x to the third, right? You take the top exponent minus the bottom exponent. Top exponent minus the bottom exponent. So I get 5x what? Squared. And now let's try to do the shortcut. So I'm going to take the derivative now. I'm going to put the prime. And then what would the derivative of the first term be? The whole thing. 27x what? To the two, yes, squared. Mm -hmm. And then we'll put my plus sign. And what would be the derivative of the next term? Not 25, 10x, yes. Two times the five, 10. And then when you take away one, it's just a little invisible one, right? Good, good, good. And so that's it. We don't have to mess around with that one no more. You don't have to write this step. If you saw this and you just split them and reduced them in your head and got that, that is totally okay. Let's see if we can do that here. So let's try not to write this step. Let's try to simplify our function without having to visually see it split, okay? So in your brain, you're going to be doing this over this, this over this, and this over this. Now, when you do the first one, x to the fourth over x cubed, what do you get after you simplify? You get x. And then for the next term, minus three, because the cubes would both go away, right? What about the last term? Yes, because it would stay, right? Seven over x cubed. But we know we can't have it looking like a fraction, right? So if you move it up, it'll become a negative three exponent. If you have to do this and then simplify and then move it to the top, you know, breaking it all down, that is totally okay. Make sense and you want to shortcut all of that stuff. Okay. Now, derivative. What's the derivative of x? One. What is the derivative of three? Zero. What is the derivative of this term? Negative 21, x to the negative four. Remember when negative? Yes. And when it's negative, it just makes it worse. More negative, right? <laughs> okay, now I can clean that up though, right? Definitely, especially with that zero there. It's just gonna be 21 x to the negative four. And Tristan says it expects, expects it like that, so we'll just leave it like that. So for those of you that had to see it, we split it like this. Oops. Mm -hmm. 3x cubed over x cubed, 7 over x cubed. Here we got x. Here, those went away, we got three. And here it stayed like that because nothing reduced, right? But we know with this last one, it can't be looking like a fraction, so it has to come up. And when it does, the exponent becomes negative, right? Just in case someone didn't follow this. You guys have to speak up though, okay? If you see, you don't see something, or don't see where it came from, say something, okay? Yes. Yes, when this guy goes up to the top, it will become a negative exponent. Yes. Okay, on our sheet, it tells you on number seven on the sheet. First, it tells me the derivative of x is one, right? It also tells me the derivative of a constant is zero. Mm -hmm. And since I had just three, the derivative of three would just be zero. Okay. 
Okay, this one's weird. How do we fix this one? Because it's a fraction, we can't have that, right? Uh -huh, I heard one fourth and he said, turn the radical into a fourth power. Can I do two steps at one? Will you follow? Do you agree with this? Right, we have a rule for our radicals because nowhere in here do we have any radicals. There's no derivatives of radicals. I mean, they'll tell you that the answer will have radicals, but there's no derivative of radicals on the site. You're never taking a derivative of a radical ever, okay? Because we know that radicals can be written as exponents and there is rules for the exponents, right? So we did use that rule. But I also used another rule and that was the fact that if I'm down here and I don't want a fraction, what happens to the exponent? So if I had x cubed down here and I want to move it up, it would be x to one power negative. So when I move that guy up, that's why it's going to get negative. Okay. But the power in here is what goes in the numerator. So what's the power? One. And then the index is what goes in the denominator, and my index is four. Right? So my power, my index, and then to get it up there, to the negative. The other one that did not change, right? It just stayed exactly the same. So then now what is the derivative function? Try to do the shortcut. What would be the derivative of that first term? It is one half. What is two times negative one fourth? It's negative one half. Right? Two, oops, two times negative one fourth. It's negative one half, right? But then what do I get when I take away one? When I take away one from the exponent, what's my new exponent? Negative five over four. Now there's my constant multiplier, but what is the derivative of tangent? It is secant squared. Mm -hmm. I'm just writing these little notes on the side so you know where the numbers came from. Okay. We're getting close to the end. So Avi, did you find the problem you no, were talking about? Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It happens, yes. Okay, how would I rewrite this one? Because we already know we cannot take the derivative yet of fractions or radicals. So how could I fix this so that it's not a radical? There's my constant multiplier, but what, how can I rewrite the square root of X? X to the power one for my exponent. And then the index is what? Is two. And then this one can stay exactly the way it is. Now I'm gonna actually do my derivative. Who could tell me what the derivative of that is? Like after it's all simplified and everything. X to the negative one over two. Mm -hmm. And how do we get no number in front? Mm -hmm. Two times the one half is just one, isn't it? So there's like an invisible one in the front. And then what is one half minus one? My exponent, it's negative one half. So that's why my exponent turns negative one half. And e to the x is nice, right? Cause it's like its own derivative, okay? Yes.
Understood. <laughs> Have a good one. Yes, sir. Okay, last one. This one's a little bit weird, but it's going to come back when we get to chapter four. Like what we do here in this problem, we're going to be doing the entire chapter in chapter four. Okay. Um, it's just the functions are different. And then sometimes they give me a function with like a whole paragraph scenario or problems, right? Um, but essentially, we're going to be doing the same thing. And, and we'll talk about its significance when we get to chapter four. But right now, we just need to talk about what the heck are they asking me for? Okay. So they say determine at which determine the point at which the graph of the function below has a horizontal tangent line. Does anybody have any ideas what they're asking me for? Mm -hmm. And what do we know about horizontal lines? Yeah, there you go. They have a slope of zero. Right? If you look at a horizontal line, what is the slope of that horizontal line? It's zero. So you basically want to find out at which point does your slope equal zero? What is the calculus way to find slope of a tangent line? It's a derivative. So you're essentially asking yourself, when does no f, right? You're asking yourself when y prime equals zero okay what point does that happen at i won't know until i actually figure out what y prime is equal it to zero and then try to figure out where that's happening okay so this one's not too bad to take the derivative of what is y prime three x squared uh-huh plus what just six because the derivative of x is one and what's six times the one? Just six. Now, what happens if I set this equal to zero? How do we solve for x? Mm -hmm. So when I do that, I'll get this equation. Then what do I do? Divide by three. When I do that, I will get this answer. Can x squared ever be a negative? Never. So then what do I say in the box for this problem? I don't know if it says b and e or none. It says none. Okay, so we'll say none. What if the problem was this? What if the problem was that? What would y prime be? Three X with the two mm -hmm. plus three. So let me change it completely because that's still going to give me a bad answer. <laughs> so then if I were to have a minus in there and I set it equal to zero, I would have to add that three over. I would have to divide by the three in the front. And then how would I solve that? X would equal what? plus or minus the square root of one, which is plus or minus one. So how many points are there then? Two points. And if I wanna know the actual point, you have one comma what, negative one comma what? How do you figure out what goes on the other half of the point? You plug it into the derivative? If you plug it into the derivative, you're finding the slope at the tangent line. What's it gonna be? It's gonna be zero, right? <laughs> Right, because the original is the one that gives me what y is, right? I'm looking for y. So the original tells me what y is. So what do you get if you cube a one? No, not that one. What do you get if you cube a positive one? Mm -hmm. And then if I multiply positive one times negative three, negative three. So what's one minus three? Negative two. So we're basically just doing this, right? And we got negative two. And then if I do the same thing with negative one, what do we end up with? Here, this is a negative one, and this is actually a positive three. So we end up with positive two. 
And so then these are your two points. It's really, really light, sorry. But I just wanted you to have an example where it actually worked out because I don't know which variation you'll get when you get to number 20, whether everyone's answer is none or some of you actually have answers. Okay, um, after that, we're just going to work on homework. So if you've already finished your web assignment, then you're free to go. If not, take this time to just knock out that homework assignment. And I'll go by and answer questions. Thank you. 